Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Rich Harvey, CEO of Property Buyer. And uh, thank you for joining our webinar today uh, about the Sydney property, buy, Sydney property market, where to find the best pockets of value. And joining me today, I have uh, the renowned Terry Ryder, the uh, head of hotspotting.com.au. Welcome, Terry. Hi, Rich. Always good to, to be here with you talking about our favourite subject, which is residential property. Absolutely. So, Terry, just before we get started, could you just give us, uh, the, the viewers, just a quick little bit of background, just a, a quick 20, 30 second background on yourself and what your company does? Uh, the hotspotting website business started in 2006 um, and its objective was to uh, help real estate investors identify the best places around Australia to buy. And uh, that's still our core business, although increasingly we're, we've expanded uh, into other areas, providing services to real estate businesses particularly um, providing reports on areas of interest to them. And um, that's, that's basically what we're about, um, the best places to buy, because that's, that's the question we get probably 90% of the mm -hmm. time. The question is, uh, where's the best place to buy? Or what do you think of this location? Um, but, uh, a particular location that, that a, a potential buyer might have in their minds and they want to know what we think about it. So that's the demand that we're servicing with what we do. Fantastic. Well, we've been a avid subscriber and advocate of your services, Terry, for many years. So I really appreciate you taking the time today to share it with us. So um, I'm gonna share my screen with everybody. So we'll just pop it up on the, uh, the screen here. Um, Terry, you can see the screen all good there? I can. Fantastic. Yep. All right, well, let's get started. So um, as I mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of propertybuyer.com.au. We're an exclusive buyer's agent. We never sell, we just help our clients to uh, get a take on the market create a strategy and help them to buy in the best possible location and the best possible property. Um, just by way of background, um, just the ends of my company, I've been going for 20 years this year. Um, we've been uh, won a, a whole lot of gongs along the way, a couple of uh, awards. Uh, also been the president of REBA, the Buyers Agent Association of Australia, the chairman of the Buyers Agent Chapter for the Real Estate Institute and helped to improve ethics and uh, standards in the industry. And I'm an active member of the Property Professionals Association of Australia and a qualified property investment advisor. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, today, we're gonna to do a couple of things. We're gonna give you a quick snapshot on the property market. We'll just talk about where Sydney sits in the national scheme, where we think the market might be going for the next, say, six to 12 months, uh, coming out of COVID and, and getting through the rest of COVID. And then we're gonna get into the real detail, Terry, about where, where are the good spots to buy. Uh, particularly based on your latest report on the top five hotspots. We're also going to cover some trends and then lastly look at some testimonials and examples of how buyers should be actually approaching this market. So we've got a really jam-packed hour to, to get through, Terry, so we won't, won't yeah. delay and, and get stuck into it. So firstly, uh, market update. Let's have a look at where dwelling values are sitting year to date. And what's interesting, Terry, is that you know property prices are still in, in positive territory. Um, what's your thoughts on this, Terry? Well, I think there's a huge disconnect between the, the messages people are getting from media and the actual reality in markets. Uh, we've, we've been being told constantly, uh, because we're researching uh, media every day right around the country, um, and we're finding the message are the prices are falling across Australia. They simply aren't. Mm. Um, in most cases, in most places in Australia, prices are holding steady or rising a little. Um, and the, the uh, graphic on the screen illustrates that this is the, um, the position of prices on average in the capital cities relative to 12 months ago. And there's only one of them that's actually down. Mm. Uh, the others are still up. Mm. Uh, in the more short term, more recently, some markets in um, some of our cities have come back. But in actual fact, uh, most places not. Um, an example is Canberra. Um, according to the core logic figures, we've been in this pandemic for six months Canberra's recorded growth in its house prices in each one of those six months. Adelaide's done something very similar. And uh, so the overall position um, across the country generally is, is very strong, um, surprisingly strong relative to what um, media has been telling us and what the economists have been forecasting. Exactly. So we'll, we'll get into that more in, in a moment. So um, if we look at the, the last or the last 28 days, what they call the rolling average um, of, of home values, um, it's basically since March, since when the COVID uh, uh, impact really hit, you can see how obviously we hit probably 
Um, the bottom of COVID um, impact was probably around July and we've started to climb out of it. Obviously, um, Melbourne is, is putting a drag back on confidence again, uh, but you know, Victorians, we, we really feel for you and we'll, we'll get through. But it's interesting to see how we've got a bit of a J curve going on there um, with the index. So the basic core logic is saying that the rate of decline is actually is slowing and decelerating, which is, which is positive news for the market. And then we go to, um, sorry, Jerry. It's, the, it's worth pointing out that's the average for the capital cities and media does tend to tick talk in generalisations. The average is dragged down by the, particularly the Melbourne situation. Mm. If you took Sydney and Melbourne out of those figures, it would be above the line. It would actually be in the positive. And if you yeah. also included the major regional centres of Australia, would it be even more so? Exactly. Exactly. Good point. Um, if we look also, it's, it's also important to remember that consumer sentiment uh, really tracks very closely with the volume of, of sales, actual number of sales that are taking place. And, and sales volumes have been weak, uh, particularly in the last, uh, in, you know, last 12 months, but obviously during COVID, it's been people holding off selling, thinking they won't get the, uh, the value that they, they should get for their property. So sales volumes um, has, has fallen. So, and consumer confidence has been up and been rising and falling. It's been a lot more volatile, particularly in the last three to four months going there. Now let's have a look also at auction clearance rates. Uh, if you see here, the big dip obviously is the impact of COVID. And this is just for the Sydney market. Um, you can see that obviously the last six months of last year was very strong. We were nudging high 70s, even 80% clearance rates. Um, beginning of the year, it started strong and then it dropped off a bit of a cliff for about two months. And then it's research resurfaced, I should say, between about 60 to 70% the last couple of weeks. Um, and actually the clearance rates on this next slide from last weekend, we had an average of 69% clearance rate. So pretty healthy market, Terry, across all the major markets in Sydney and um, some pretty strong results. Um, I missed out on an auction on, on the weekend on the Northern Beaches for a client. Uh, there were three bidders there. Uh, the Channel 7 new crew didn't really help me by being right next to me, but uh, uh, there was a guy in the corner that really wanted this property in Fairlight. So missed out, but uh, yeah, that's the way it is sometimes. Um, yeah. As we go through from auction clearance rates, let's have a look at actual dwelling values um, over the last quarter. Um, and you can see that dwelling values fell for the month only 0.5%, but for the quarter, they were down 2.1% for the past three months. But as we indicated in that first slide, still up 9.8% year to date. So even though the markets declined year on year to date, they're still up um, from the record high, which was July 2017, just over three years ago. Um, now, Terry, I'll come to some of your slides in a minute, but let's have a look at the long-term view. So people are saying, Rich, wh wh how should we look at the market? Well, I often like to look at the long-term view. So let's go back to the 1960s and let's look at all of the big growth phases that we've had in the property market um, right, across, right across the board. And all the times you can see the, the little circles there, there's around seven, I'm missing one here in the last second. So there's only seven major times we've had major declines. But again, if we take a long-term uh, view of the market, Terry, you can see that the market's done pretty well, Calvin. Yeah, yeah, it has. Uh, I, think, I think it's done remarkably well. I think um, the, the last six months is probably the best possible advertisement for residential property as an asset class that you could possibly imagine because mm -hmm. it has shown such incredible resilience in the face of unimaginable forces. And um, it's... Um, we haven't seen a collapse in prices that um, some economists had predicted. Many economists, in fact, predicted back in um, about March and April. And um, it's it's just um, um, e even Melbourne, which has been going through that second wave, which has had a huge impact on individuals and on the economy of Melbourne. Um, prices are still maintaining a, an extraordinary level of resilience. Uh, sales are still happening somehow, despite the lockdown. Mm. Um, but other parts of the country where things are relatively normal, and that's most of Australia, uh, um, markets are pumping. I'm, I'm having conversations across the country with all kinds of real estate professionals every day, be they buyers agents or valuers, selling agent, builder developers, and consumers. And 90% um, of the conversations are very positive because there's activity happening at, at quite a surprisingly high level in uh, most markets around Australia. Mm. I think the word that I would use is resilience. And I think we're, it's a bit of an overused word, but that's the one that we're seeing going forward. Um, just a quick little plug here for uh, a book that I was a co-author in um, 
about a year ago. If you'd like to get a copy of my book, The Secrets of Property Millionaires Exposed, just shoot an email to my assistant, Michelle, at info at property buyer. Now, normally we retail these for uh, $30, but we're today happy to give it away for half price. So if you'd like a copy of that, just shoot an email saying um, with that discount code COP2019 and we can, including postage, get that out to you as soon as you like. Um, let's have a look, Terry, at some of the trends. So what are the key trends that we're seeing coming out in 2020 and through this COVID period? Just give us a little rundown on your, your view of the market there. Yeah, there are a couple of really notable trends. Um, first home buyers are really the most active cohort. Investors are relatively quiet at the moment, but home buyers are definitely dominating. First home buyers in particular, um, for the average first home buyer, if you've got secure employment, it's a great time to be a buyer. Interest has never been so low and the level of government assistance to first home buyers has never been so high. So that's a, an important trend. And um, I think in, investors will, would be wise to follow first home buyers because where they're buying, uh, their, their activity is going to push prices up. Um, the exodus to affordable lifestyle, I think, is the biggest single trend in real estate at the moment. It was underway before the pandemic, but the lockdown phase has opened people's eyes to the possibilities of working from home, both the employees and the employers who suddenly realised, well, if we've got a significant number of our team working efficiently and effectively from home, our office costs can be lowered. And so that's become a big, big trend. And it uh, doesn't mean that everyone's leaving the big cities. Partly that's it, but it also means people are choosing to live in different parts of a major city. And Sydney's a great case in point. We'll talk about some examples as we go through the presentation. Low vacancies is a massive trend across Australia. In most parts of Australia, vacancies are not only low, but very, very low. That includes parts of Sydney, even though the average for Sydney is above 3% in individual pockets, and we'll talk about some of those today, uh, vacancies are much, much lower. Mm. And that's putting pressure on rents. And when rents are rising, prices tend to follow. Mm. And the final trend is the impact of infrastructure spending. That's always an impact on residential property, but it's going to be the big one going forward because we. it's very clear that state and federal governments are going to try to recover our economy by spending big on infrastructure and bringing forward shovel-ready projects, you know, tens of billions of dollars worth around the country. It's going to be a big one. Excellent. Yeah, I think that one about, uh, about escape to affordable lifestyle, that's really what I call acceleration of the dream. And we're seeing evidence of that in helping clients to, uh, to really get that dream in the lifestyle areas because they can work from home now. Um, so, Terry, we've seen um, prices rising almost everywhere. Pretty much just to recap of that first slide. But I guess the key point I'd like you to sort of just quickly touch on is the corollary is the regional areas are also seeing um, uh, a reasonable increase as well, right? Yeah, and, and particularly recently, uh, I think you know, regional areas have been performing very strongly. Um, and it's been helped by the fact that in most regional areas, the, the, the virus is, is just not a reality. It's a, it's a big city thing mm. for most <laughs> people in regional Australia. Um, but yeah, we've been seeing good growth um, in most regional areas in the last 12 months and in every capital city except Perth. And Perth is actually starting to get some momentum too. But it's really significant that Sydney is still well up on the price levels of last year despite six months of pandemic. Mm. Melbourne's still 6% up. Canberra's doing well. Uh, Hobart's doing well. And... Um, Regional Tasmania has been a leader as well. So, yeah, plenty of growth markets around the country. And it's important for people to grasp that because the messages from media are very different and they're just plain wrong. Yeah. All right. And uh, as you mentioned, Terry, we've seen vacancy rates in the capital cities uh, being actually pretty pretty reasonable, pretty tight. Um, you know, they obviously, when, when COVID first hit and a lot of the Airbnb properties uh, went back into the long-term rental pool, that shot the vacancy rates up. But it's interesting to see how much they've been absorbed um, in the various capital cities. And uh, we're starting to see that, I believe, trending down in a, a more normalised market. They are trending down, uh, Rich. And, and in fact, um, we wrote that slide um, a couple of days ago. And like, as of today, there's, there's new figures out. And pretty much in every one of those cities, except Melbourne, they've actually fallen further. Mm. In seven of the eight capital cities, the vacancy rate. So we now have a situation where most capital cities are below um, 1.5 percent. Yeah, um, Sydney is around 3.4 percent, I think now. But as I said, some pockets of Sydney are much, much lower than that. Um, one or one and a half or two percent. Mm -hmm. So, huge factor in the market. Um, 
it's a trade that investors should be saying, hey, that's significant. We should be actually taking action because when vacancies are very low, rents are rising. When rents are rising strongly, prices will follow. And that's going to be a driving force in the market going forward from this. Yep. Excellent. Um, and the other big one is infrastructure spend. You know, we, um, we always talk about this, Terry, has been a major impetus uh, for, for both the economy and for property markets, right? Absolutely. You know, you know, we, we, so I know we've said in some of our previous uh, communications, Rich, that um, if you want a, a simple strategy um, as a property investor, follow the infrastructure trail, buy property that lies in the path of progress. And by that we mean infrastructure spending yeah. is hugely influential. Yeah, well, let's get into some of the detail of that in some of these next few slides, Terry. So we're going to, um, our viewers, we're going to target five main areas around Sydney, starting with the Sutherland Shire. We'll do a quick sort of whip around the, the Sydney market and identify what we believe is some of the, the key uh, hot pockets that we think are going to have some really good growth potential and some of the reasons why. So firstly, just starting with the Sutherland Shire, uh, also known as God's Country, some beautiful waterways uh, down there near Port Hacking, uh, Cronulla Beach there, you can see the aerial shot. Uh, overlooking and, and further south down to Bundina, where you've got the Royal National Park. Um, but look, again, Terry, take us through these vacancy rates for some of these key areas. Why, why do you think they're so low? Look, I think it's, it's partly because um, of that, um, that movement to um, what I call the exodus to affordable lifestyle. This is a great example in the Sydney metro area of that. It was actually you that first alerted me to the potential of this area. Um, it's one that I hadn't sort of been fully aware of. And when we started to look at it in depth, we realised how right you were about it because in Sydney terms, it's very affordable. It's got a wonderful, um, you know, a combination of rivers and beaches and national parks the lifestyle factor is huge mm. um so it really does uh tick that box of exodus to affordable lifestyle mm. and those vacancy rates sort of reflect its popularity um sydney's average is three and a half percent but all of the postcodes of sutherland shire are much much lower and some of them are way below one percent mm. that means that very very tight um not much available for rent and if you're a landlord and owns property there, you're going to be getting a pretty good rental return. Mm -hmm. And of all, as we know at the bottom of the slide, all of those postcodes, their vacancy rates have fallen in the past three months. Mm. And, you know, and through the pandemic period. Yeah, and also let's look at some of the median prices too. I think you've just meant, touched on the word affordability. So if we look at some of the median prices in, in these key areas in the Shire, um, for example, Engadine 950, that's that's an area where I believe it's it is obviously further a fair way down uh, the, the train line, but again, just under the million dollar mark um, to get an area that's that's really family friendly, uh, got some some great parks and great attributes. So, you know, if you were looking at the equivalent um, type suburbs on the northern beaches, you'd be paying sort of around one six to about one point eight five as an equivalent. So, I think the thing I like about the Shire is its proximity to uh, the Royal National Park, the proximity to the airport, uh, proximity to the beaches and the waterways. And I guess also, again, a bit like the Northern Beach, it's got a relaxed, family-friendly atmosphere. It's not dominated by any one kind of demographic. Um, it's got an aspiring demographic. It's not a low demographic. And um, you've got places like Janali, where there's a lot of new development coming in because that's been touted as a bit of a, a bit of a hot spot for, uh, for new developers moving in to try and get some higher density in there. And also places yeah. like Uruwe and Sutherland, but just over that million dollar mark. Lots of good schools in the area too, Rich, and there's the number of private schools, and that's always a factor for buyers. Mm. Uh, they've got um, very, very good attraction in, in that regard. A um, couple of other things I noticed, the, the unemployment rate in this um, municipality is well, well below state and national averages, uh, another indicator of the strength of this market. Mm, exactly. So um, a lot of those factors, I think, Lee, when you've got aspiring home buyers and, and also for some good places right for renovation you're going to see some good price growth and that'll be sort of pulled up um, to, to sort of par with the rest of sydney as we go forward so i think you know the shire gets a really big tick and it's uh it's really one of our number one areas we think that it's the right box for affordability and lifestyle uh, going forward uh, if you look at also unit prices again um, compared to other parts of sydney really attractive area and also quite an affordable uh, affordable price point Obviously, Cronulla, you can see there, it's a bit higher at 810,000. That's, again, right on the beachfront. Um, um, but, uh, again, places close to the train line. You're only about 40 minutes uh, train journey to the CBD. 
and, uh, and good public transport access there as well. All right, um, that's probably enough on the Shire, unless you had any other points to make on the Shire, Terry, from your notes. Very good long-term growth rates, Rich, you know, there's something that investors might look at. What's the track record? Um, many of the suburbs in the Shire have long-term capital growth rates of 7 or 8% per year, which is right up with the best um, in the country, really. Mm. Yeah, well, that's great. And 7 or 8% is a fantastic long-term average. And I think coming off a lower base, I think it's got some, some really good upside uh, for, for future growth going forward uh, long-term. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a quick trip out down out west, out to uh, the Badgeries Creek area. And obviously one of the biggest infrastructure projects of the decade uh, for many years is the construction of Badgeries Creek due to be finished in 2026. Um, so I have dual runways, um, and a lot of spin off there to the, the local areas. So Terry, take us through why you think this Badgeries Creek area is so good and, and, and the vacancy rates and the growth rates in, uh, proposed for, for that area. Uh, we referred at, at, um, at the beginning to some of the major influences and trends and infrastructure spending was one we particularly identified and we think it's going to be even bigger going forward because um, politicians are going to seek to recover our economies by a big infrastructure spend um, bringing forward shovel ready projects. This is one of the biggest anywhere in the country. It's not the only one that's impacting on Western Sydney which is now one of the, the nation's largest growth economies. Mm. Um, the thing about it in the airport isn't so much the airport. Well, the airport itself is significant, but what springs up around it is what's so important. Mm. Um, it becomes in a massive jobs. And as we see, we see that already in all of our major cities that there's a big commercial industrial precinct of businesses that like to be close to major airports. And that's the biggest, most significant thing about it. They're calling it the Aerotropolis. Mm. in terms of the Badgeries Creek, the Western Sydney Airport. And that's going to be, um, a, you know, a massive job. So tens of thousands of jobs are going to be created, uh, not just in the airport itself, but in the, the business that want to be close to it. Mm. And people, uh, the research shows, want to live close to where they work. So uh, suburbs that are within maybe 30 or 40 minutes of this massive piece of infrastructure um, are going to see uplift and buy demand, particularly as it becomes closer to reality. It's not far away, you know, it's really underway in terms of construction. Terry, I'll just uh, make one point about the Aerotropolis and the jobs factor. I mean, the types of jobs that will be located in this Aerotropolis, um, they're not going to be menial jobs, right? What kind of jobs do we think are going to be created in this Aerotropolis market? Well, um, look, look, it's many and varied, but, um, you know, one other thing that's going to be part of it is the Sydney Science Park, which is a $5 billion enterprise that's, that's been uh, created in conjunction with, with the airport project. There's also going to be the Penrith Health and Education Precinct. So it's, it's not just sort of warehousing and workshop type um, businesses and jobs. It's, um, it's actually um, a, a huge variety of um, you know, technology type industries are going to be there and many of the people working there will be very well paid individuals. Um, so it's, it's going to be yeah. uh, something that's going to give real uplift and momentum to property yeah. markets. I, I think it's going to be a high, um, a really sort of a high paying area for high quality jobs. So anyone in the science field or aeronautical field obviously need to be university trained and educated. So the kinds of incomes that those people will be earning will be reflected in the style of housing that people will want in that local area. So that also bodes well for that um, areas, again, as Terry said, within 30 to 40 minutes of some of these key areas. Um, let's just have a look now, Terry, at some of the, the, the key suburbs that we've been looking at or talking about in this area. So there's quite a mix uh, of areas here. Now, some of the, I guess, the standouts, like, I mean, the Ludnam area is, is probably, it says here, statistically not relevant because you've got a lot of large, you know, uh, you know, one, two and five acre blocks that are still being sold in that Ludnam area. There's still a lot of subdivisions can still occur. Um, you know, places like uh, like Busby or Holsworthy, uh, Liverpool, I think, is certainly uh, a strong market um, going forward. Um, uh, where else Where else would you recommend some of the investors would look at in this area, Terry? I, I do like Liverpool. Um, you know, it's a wonderful. It's like a, a CBD in its own right, with wonderful facilities, uh, hospitals, education facilities, shopping, etc. Um, so the suburbs, sort of, I'd say between Liverpool and the new airport, would, would be 
ones to target um, out around um, Blacktown as well. But um, one of the things um, people might note from the, the detail on the screen, the again, the long-term growth rate, 7 and 8% in many cases. Mm. And, um, you know, one, one of the, the myths and misconceptions that are out there in media is that you've got to be close to the CBD to get the best growth rates. Well, I think, you know, the research just blows that out of the water again and again. We're a long way out west in Sydney with many of these locations, but they've had very, very good long-term growth rates. And I would suggest they're going to get better over time because of the impact of mm. um, the the Western Sydney Airport and the Aerotropolis. Mm. I think you made a good point too, not to just focus. I mean, you can't pick winners just on a one-year average. You know, there's a lot of um, factors like COVID and, uh, and other economic impacts or political factors. Last year, we had two elections that can impact a one-year growth number. So <coughs> it's very important to, to look at the long-term growth rates of these areas uh, yep. going forward. Um, any other thoughts you've got about the, <coughs> excuse me, the Badgerys Creek area? Um, Affordability is probably a big factor. You know, by Sydney terms, um, that this is one of the, the most affordable precincts, um, but it's also um, where they are expecting um, a big chunk of the jobs in the Sydney metropolitan area to be created mm. in the next ten or twenty years. Um, and I just reiterate again, by property that lies in the path of progress, and then we're talking about infrastructure. I think it's the single biggest reason why Sydney has performed so well in the past half dozen years is because the infrastructure spend has been so big and this is going to continue that process exacerbated by the recovery efforts of governments coming out of the pandemic period. And um, this is where the jobs are going to be created. This is where there's a higher level of affordability. And so we're going to increasingly um, see people as home buyers looking, looking to establish homes in this area. Yep. And um, investors should follow that trend. Mm. Excellent. No, I couldn't agree with you more on that, that thought process, Terry. Absolutely. Um, let's move to our third area now, um, the pristine northern beaches. Um, again, uh, the, or the Insula Peninsula, as sometimes the locals like to refer to it. So again, some beautiful uh, areas. Uh, again, sometimes a little bit loved to death. If you're sort of trying to get a, a park in Manly on the weekend, uh, you, you're better off to just leave the car at home and catch a bus sometimes or catch the ferry. Um, but look, the, the markets in, um, in uh, the Northern Beaches have been performing incredibly well. I've, I've just been quite blown away at how resilient um, some of the, uh, the prices have been through the COVID period. Um, just personally, as a local resident of the Northern Beaches, you know, I found that the best time to buy was when there was peak panic. Back in that sort of late March, early April phase, that was a really great time to buy because some of the vendors were freaking out about COVID and how much the market might have dropped. And we're willing to really negotiate. But now we're heading into the spring market. You know, the vendors are still a bit nervous, but not nearly as nervous as they were. And so prices have been quite resilient and they've been holding up quite well throughout this whole process. Um, so you've got some um, really interesting results here, Terry, on the screen. You've got, um, you know, places like Lamby, uh, Heights, Beacon Hill, um, not far from, uh, from about sort of a 10 minute drive to the beach. Um, you've got places like uh, French's Forest. Interesting to see the, the vacancy rates a little bit high in French's Forest, um, but uh, the vacancy rates are quite a, quite a mixed bag there, Terry. They are. There's, there's more variety there than we've seen in some of those other areas that we've just looked at. Um, you know, partly the, the, these are the sorts of areas where investors might own apartments and the and but have them in the Airbnb system, and of course that has been curtailed by. Uh, the pandemic and the, the closure of borders and the shutdown of flights. And so a lot of those uh, short-term rental propositions have gone into the long-term rental pool and they've pushed up vacancies in some of those postcodes, not all of them. Some of them are still quite tight. Mm. But, um, yeah, so I, I think that's... Manly, um, I, I used to own a property in Manly myself, and Manly is a very seasonal market. You don't want to be leasing a property in the winter months. Um, you definitely want to be leasing in spring or summer uh, or beginning of the year. Um, and you get a much higher rental. So again, some of these markets are very affected by seasonal factors where people want to get settled uh, for school um, and for the new year before they, they, um, they get underway for the year. Um, all right, some of the unit prices there are pretty strong. Um, some of the most sought after suburbs in Australia is, is Freshwater. Um, Realestate.com actually reports it's probably the number one most sought after suburb, very tightly held. We get a lot of requests for buyers to try and get into that market. Um, and we do get access to a lot of off markets there, but again, very tightly held, very competitive market. 
a fantastic long-term capital growth, great village feel. Um, places like French's Forest is going through a, a change or a metamorphosis. Um, French's Forest has a new uh, hospital, um, the Northern Beaches Hospital, that's just been completed just over 12 months ago. And that's a, uh, a quite a, a magnet for um, doctors and nurses and medical staff and people getting treatment. And some of the areas around that hospital will be rezoned in the next uh, 12 months. So you'll start to see a slightly higher density. And that's why that's going to be, um, it's also earmarked as a, um, an area for higher economic activity under the Sydney Metropolitan Plan uh, going forward. Um, what else can we tell you about the Northern Beaches? I've got one more slide, I think, here, Terry, going forward. This is the housing, uh, the housing market here. I just move that across there. So median prices, obviously a lot higher than the Shire, um, but you've got some median prices there, ranging from you know, French's Forest at about almost 1.6 million, uh, up to Manly at almost $3 million for our house. So again, um, the premium and really high demand areas that's reflected in those median prices. And, yeah. um, and pretty, pretty good volume of sales there too, Terry. Pretty reasonable turnover um, in those markets. Yeah. One thing I'd say, um, there are some extra pockets of it. There are some suburbs that aren't on this list that are rejoining uh, some of these suburbs. So if you look at places like Narrabeen uh, or, or Eleanora Heights. Um, now, Eleanora Heights is, I, I think, is a little hidden pocket or North Narrabeen. You're just up behind uh, the, the lake there. It's got some beautiful properties. A little bit uh, further to get to, but um, the one point I'd make about the Northern Beaches is the Northern Beaches Tunnel is proposed to be built in the next six to seven years. Um, and that will link up with the Wakehurst Parkway, the uh, tunnel under the Spit Bridge and connect up with the Ruringa Freeway. And that will remove travel time or reduce travel time quite significantly. And that's going to be a game changer um, for areas, quite a lot of suburbs and, and reduce travel time from places like DY, Cromer and Balgowland. So, There'll be a number of suburbs around where that Northern Beaches Tunnel is going that will really improve uh, both travel time and property prices quite significantly, Terry. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the standout features of this market is its consistency through uh, thick and thin. Um, you know, Sydney's been for a boom, then there was a correction phase, sort of 2018 into 2019. But through that, the Northern Beaches, I think, still continue to perform. And in particular places like Freshwater that you mentioned, that um, is our personal pick for that, that area. And it's, it's consistency through it, no matter what's going on in the broader market. It just seems to turn over with such enormous consistency of sales activity. And um, it's one reason why its long-term growth rates are uh, so good, 8% PE for houses and 7% for apartments. Mm. Pretty good uh, performance and uh, vacancies tend to be consistently low in that area too. Mm. Yeah, I mean, people love, um, if people don't know the, the freshwater area, it's got a really lovely village feel. It's got a really kid family uh, friendly beach, a really nice little surf break. Um, you know, you can, it's just got a really nice, when you walk out in the surf, it's quite easy to, to catch the water there. So really, really uh, highly sought after. All right, I think that's probably enough on the Northern Beaches. Let's head out further west again. Let's head back to Blacktown, uh, Terry, and look at, again, another area that's getting some really good pickup um, from uh, infrastructure. And also there's the Blacktown Hospital uh, with it that's been upgraded. Um, and let's have a look at some of the vacancy rates around some of these areas. Again, again, another mixed bag of, of results. Um, but again, quite a diverse range of suburbs here. You've got places like Plumpton or Mount Druitt, uh, which have been considered sort of a, a lower demographic, but actually performed quite well. See how low the vacancy rate is there in Plumpton, Terry, 0.9 and Mount Druitt, 1.2%. Um, and I personally yeah. know quite a few investors that have done extremely well out of the Mount Druitt market. Um, put aside any kind of prejudice and invested there and done extremely well. Yeah. And um, Mount Druitt has been targeted by the state government announced uh, maybe a month ago, a massive spend um, in the central areas of Mount Druitt infrastructure spend um, to, to lift that area, um, part of their recovery from pandemic uh, strategy. Um, I think the significant thing in those figures on the screen is the, the areas where the vacancies are higher are, are the areas where there's new estates being developed and they, they do tend to have fluctuating vacancy rates because new products coming into the market are quite constant, like Riverstone, for example. Mm. Uh, whereas the more established suburbs have got very, very low vacancy rates, like um, you know, Plumpton, Quakers Hill, Mount Druitt, um, well below 2%. And uh, so, again, uh, tight rental markets. 
Mm. Uh, but popular, these areas are popular and have been for a long time um, because of their relative affordability. So first home buyers do target these suburbs because they're relatively affordable and they all show up in the stats on state government and grants for assistance to first home buyers as one of the, the leaders in New South Wales. Mm. Excellent. Um, and let's have a look at some of the pricing uh, in some of these areas, uh, Terry. So Blacktown, current median house price, 690000 uh, Layla Park, 650000 um, Places like Quakers Hill, 780000 So um, again, as you say, first home buyers are particularly appealing because of the price point. Um, but also because, again, family friendly um, and not too far from the CBD and good, good transport connections. Uh, Actually, I've always uh, quite liked Layla Park. It doesn't have a train in it, but it's always been one of my areas that I've been watching and, and seeing grow uh, quite consistently there. And you've got an average growth rate of, of 7% there for, uh, for Layla Park. But, but look at the volume of sales there in Blacktown, 430. So significant volume of turnover. Um, but again, pretty strongly consistent average growth rate, 8% uh, going forward. Um, I think you'll find places like uh, Schofields and Riverston um, again, a lot of uh, a lot of new land or, or larger land that's been subdivided in those areas uh, going forward. I know there's a lot of land developers chasing land lots and we've got some of those developers acquire those lots. Um, so you'll see an increase in supply the further out you go. So even in the further out you go to places like Rouse Hill, there's still significant farmland that's yet to be carved up. So I think as you go further out, um, there'll probably be a a lower rate of growth because there'll be a greater volume of property coming on the market in the future. So that's just something to bear in mind for, for future capital growth, Terry. Mm. Yeah, um, again, uh, infrastructure is a key word here. Um, you know, the Blackdown area has got you know, university campus, major hospital, you had an image of uh, that just a few slides ago, um, affordability. But proximity to jobs nodes, it's such an important factor um, in, uh, dictating where people choose to, to buy as home buyers. Mm. And um, people might say a long way from the CBD, but for, for people who live in these areas, the CBDs are relevant. I mean, they've got no reason to go there. They don't work there, they don't shop there, the kids don't go to school there. What do they care how far they are from the CBD? Their, their lives are based in these areas where their jobs are. Uh, they've got all the facilities they need there mm. and how things are affordable. And it's gonna be enhanced again by that um, growth of the Western Sydney economy, in particular that, that new airport and everything that will spring up around it. Mm, exactly. All right, um, let's move to our fifth area, which is the Hills District. Um, so you can see an image there, one of the, the, uh, the very infamous uh, Norwest Business Park, which has a very strong concentration of, of employment uh, going forward. A lot of big uh, Woolworths have their headquarters out there and a few other major companies have their headquarters out there. Actually, an interesting fact, Terry, probably around 30 years ago, um, I almost got a job with the local council selling all of that land when it was completely undeveloped. So uh, <laughs> it's completely transformed in the last 30 years. Um, but let's look at some of the, uh, the housing stats for the Hills area. Um, Borkham Hills, current median house price 1.2. But again, look at that growth average, 8%, really good performer. Um, Bella Vista is an interesting one. See, you note there it's got an median price of 1.585. Now, it's an interesting phenomenon. Bella Vista is quite a sought after suburb, um, you know, compared to some of its neighbours like Kellyville. And it's, it's interesting, partly to do with the name and partly to do with the style of housing and the size of the blocks in that area. It just seems to be an area that is, is more highly sought after than some of the others. And that tends to push the median price up. But you can also see much lower volume of sales, so it's obviously more tightly held. Um, and then places like Castle Hill, big volume of sales, median 1.5. Um, around Castle Hill, around the shopping centre, which is also being revamped, um, there's quite a significant area of rezoning going on, so there'll be much higher density, particularly around areas close to the new train station in, in Castle Hill, Terry. So any other thoughts on those stats there? I think one of the one of the big influences in that market, one of the reasons it's in our report is the impact of the Sydney Metro North Northwest. And I think one of the reasons that Bella Vista is, is popular is it's got a station on that new uh, piece of rail infrastructure. You know, it's, it's not just a rail line. It's what um, the plan is that each of the stations is going to be a cluster of, you know, retail and commercial and residential as well. Mm. That That's an impactor. So for Bella Vista, that's a factor. It's also very close to the, 
North West Business Park, which is still a work in progress, even though it's been um, you know, there for a couple of decades now, but it continues to expand massive, massive jobs nodes. Mm. So those are all factors. But I guess the thing that stands out for me for Hillshire is that its current, current population is a bit over 150,000, but in 15 years' time, it is expected to be 250,000. So it's an area, it's a growth area, and it's been targeted by the state government as, as a growth centre, which means a lot of um, infrastructure spending mm. is going to be invested there mm. um, to support the popular, population mm. growth that they're projecting for that, for that precinct. Mm. I think anything, um, and it's been proven in, in a lot of uh, property economics, that property uh, prices rise when you do get that new train infrastructure because it improves travel time and just improves the transport options for those areas. And, and being a heavy rail um, and driverless trains, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of infrastructure. Um, I was actually just watching a documentary the other night on how they built it, and incredible logistics. They did an amazing job uh, in making it very safe and uh, very reliable as well so a really really good uh, good piece of infrastructure for that local area to really open it up yeah. all right um so let's move into we're going to do some questions and answers also at the end so please stay on and, and you can type your questions into the chat box or the q a and we'll, we'll get to that as soon as we can but the next phase of the webinar i just want to talk about how should buyers you know look at the current market what, what's the approach that we should be taking given this COVID environment and what are the things that you can do to capitalize on the, the current environment. Well, the first thing I'd say is don't follow the herd. Um, Terry, you write about this extensively, right? And uh, don't live your life by media sound bites and headlines. You know, you, you don't want to be a lemming or a sheep and, uh, and follow the herd. So why is that, Terry? What, what, are, the, what are the headlines telling us to do? Well, um, you know, I think it's a reality that no one ever became wealthy following the herd. Yeah. The people who do succeed financially are the ones who either lead the herd or detach from the herd and head in the opposite direction, which is usually uh, the, the smartest thing to do because the herd is um, not necessarily acting on logic or based on research. The herd tends to follow the media and the media is full of misinformation. Um, so I think people need to just detach from the pack and um, think and act independently and uh, do some uh, proper research because the actual, I think, the information we're presented today is, is a great example of the, the disconnect between media messages and the reality of what's happening out there in, in markets. Um, so the herd, in terms of investors, is sort of clustered around the fringes, waiting for some single signal to stampede, which is what herds tend to do. So when they read there's a boom on, they're all diving, they're all stampede towards the market, and of course they will have missed the best time to buy at the best prices. And I think right now is an opportunity for investors. I think it's a key word for people to um, to take out of today is that opportunity is, is um, a key word for the circumstances that we're currently in. Um, opportunities to buy well in, in areas that have the credentials for long-term growth. I think there's absolutely no doubt that an area um, such as we just talked about Blacktown um, and the impact of the Western Sydney Airport, it can't help but grow over time. Yeah. Um, so now's a good time to be positioning yourself for that growth. Exactly. No, some great thoughts there. Um, so I guess, um, oh, on this, sorry, this one here. So I guess just in terms of doing that and actually activating your ability to, to find a property, just quickly, um, uh, what we do as buyers agents and myself as a buyers agent, what we do is key five key things. We help you create an investment strategy um, based on your individual situation. There's not a one size fits all approach that we take to helping our clients. It's very much about helping each person identify what strategy is going to work for them and then identifying the area that will deliver the right kind of property outcome. Obviously, we get access to a lot of off-market properties you'll never see advertised on the property portals like domain and real estate. And we save our clients a huge amount of money just by negotiating well. And I've got some examples of that coming up later on. And one of the other factors is you get someone to work alongside you who's a local expert. They know the local market. They know what drives that local market and can identify values really quickly to help you pay the right price, crunch the numbers, and basically give you that excellent confidence to, to buy well. So that's some of the key benefits you've got if you do engage our services and use a buyer's agent along the way. Um, just briefly too, before we go to the um, examples, uh, what does it cost? Uh, we work on a fixed fee basis. Um, the fees range between one and a half to 2%, depending on the price point. But for an example, a property at 500K or under, uh, the fee is simply 9,000 plus GST. You pay an engagement fee of 2,000 upfront to get us started. And then the balance of the fee once we've secured the property for you. But, 
you'll have someone working along with you and it's money well spent uh, getting good advice and good education and good support um, in making sure you pick the right kind of property for your strategy that's going forward. Um, so, and again, just a special offer today, if anyone does engage our services, we're giving a 10% discount off our engagement fee. Um, you've just got to mention the word COVID-2020. Uh, it's not a new disease, it's just a new buzzword for, for a discount, Terry. Um, so you can just shoot us an email, um, or, or when uh, Michelle sends around a copy of the slide, you can just say, yep, interested, and we can uh, organise a time to chat with Peter from my team, who's our Director of Client Strategy, to um, help you with the next steps. So for the last part, um, Terry, of our, um, uh, uh, our um, uh, webinar, I just want to give a couple of examples of what um, some recent investors and buyers have done and what, they've, and what sort of strategies they've adopted to, to do well in the Sydney market and the surrounding, surrounding markets. So these are just a couple of examples of, of what we've done recently. This was an investor that we helped uh, buy a property um, out near St Mary's. Um, and actually the St Mary's area is going off, I've got to tell you, with the announcement of the Metro North train line and where the stations are being located, this property has already gone up in value that we bought for, for this client. Now, this was a, a little three bedroom home and it doesn't look terribly attractive. You can see by the image there, it's got a bit of a pretty funny green kind of paint. But this is a classic case of look beyond the exterior and get to the interior. You know, it was a good sized block of land, 650 square metres needed a small reno, you can easily add a granny flat out the back. And if you add a granny flat for about 140K, you'll get an extra um, uh, 350 bucks a week in rent. So, you know, really strong outcome. Now we got this property at an amazing price. This was a house in Western Sydney, 525,000. And it was, again, the median price for this area is around 600,000. So we saved our client a huge packet of money. And, uh, and literally a couple of weeks ago, another one sold in the street for 595. So it's just all also about timing as to when you buy well. Um, we just bought this property about two weeks ago for an investor in Newcastle, another market that we love targeting. And this investor was chasing yield. Um, we were able to get a 7% yield for, for this particular property. It was a house converted into three flats, um, really good suburb of Newcastle called Waratah. Um, rents for over 45 grand a year from this home, uh, purchase price 640. So a pretty happy investor. Um, and wouldn't you like to have a couple of those in your self-managed super fund, Terry? It uh, certainly provides some good income. And Newcastle is such a great place to own real estate, one of the biggest cities in Australia, a, a growth economy. It's it's always going to be a performer long term. And to, mm. to buy something that's giving you a seven percent yield in, you know, from the word go. Um, Mm. You know, so you know, a lot of people think you've got to make a choice between yield and growth. That's you don't. Right. You no. buy properties like this, you can get both, and I think that's a great example of it. Yeah. So they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, as I always say. So that's a great example. Thanks for making that point. Um, and again, another one we bought in Western Sydney, um, in that local area. We got this one. The client had actually found this property and engaged us to do an appraisal and negotiate. Now we got this property for a further. Uh, 30 grand below what, what he'd already negotiated. He thought he'd have a crack himself, uh, but we knew the agent and we knew the market extremely well. And we were able to get a property that already had a granny flat in place. And again, um, saved him a good packet of money. So uh, that was a, a cracking deal. Um, another one that uh, I did recently, in uh, this was in Pennant Hills. I uh, bought this again during the, the COVID period. I saw this property on a Wednesday morning, took the clients through on the Thursday did an appraisal the same day, managed to exchange it on the Friday. So within two days of it coming on the market, I was able to get snap this home up. Now, luckily these vendors were a bit nervous and wanted to sell out quickly. So we we're able to get a pretty significant discount on the price. And it was the ability to just move quickly. Um, also had a good relationship with the agent and was able to get in before the open home on the Saturday and beat six other buyers that would have probably put an offer in on, this, on the day that they went to have a look at it. It did need a reno, but it was a, a really good buy for it a great family home. Um, this was another one I did on the Northern Beaches. Now this property should have gone to auction, um, but again, because of COVID, there weren't as many buyers around, but I managed to save them 200 grand by putting in a pre-auction offer uh, the two days before the auction was due. So again, if you can just time the offer right and get all the, all the ducks lined up in a row, there are deals to be had out there. Not saying you always get a bargain, but sometimes if you know how to move right, you know how to talk to the agent, you can get an exceptionally good deal like that. Um, another run we did in Newcastle just a couple of weeks ago, this was a fairly modern and almost new property. Um, so there wasn't a huge discount, but still a significant discount. 
and our client was very, very happy. They'll get good depreciation benefits on this property. Um, agent was guiding uh, 750, and we got it for 710. So uh, again, pretty decent saving for our client, more than covered our fees and, and all the process involved. Um, and just to finish off, one more here we bought in Manly. This was earlier in the year. I'd love to buy or repeat this deal. Um, I was able to buy, you can't quite see, it's probably the middle unit in this particular block. Um, the one above it um, had just sold for 1.3, but I managed to get the one below it for, for 1.19. Um, it didn't have really any views. It just had a district outlook. You couldn't see the water or anything. But again, 400 metre walk to the ferry walk. This will be a cracking buy um, for, for long-term growth. You know, really, really great position, tightly held. So great for a, great for a long-term investment. And have I got one more? Oh yeah, one more just to finish off. We also buy properties interstate for, for our clients. This was one in Brisbane. Um, again, a good cash flow uh, type property. Now this one had uh, multiple options. It actually easily had a granny flat um, uh, in the rear. It had a big shed there as well. So great for storage. A lot of tradies love the big storage shed. Um, you might even uh, be able to subdivide it down the track or put a bunch of townhouses on this property. But again, we're able to save the client over $40,000, but getting a strong yield. So again, Terry, getting that both growth and yield and getting multiple incomes out of the one property is another great strategy that we follow for a lot of our investors. Um, so look, why don't we go to, and if you'd like to get in touch, yeah, just please um, send me an email. If you want a copy of the slides, um, we can arrange that. We'll send around a copy of the recording, which will have all the slides in it. So if you can watch any bits you, you missed or wanted to, uh, to, to ask about. Um, and uh, if you'd like to get in touch, the numbers are all there. And also for Terry as well, if you'd like to get access to his, his reports, uh, you can go to hotspotting.com.au. So Terry, I'll just stop sharing the screen and I'll go to our Q&A uh, session now. Have we got any questions in the Q&A uh, that we need to answer? Yeah, um, both the chat panel and the Q&A, plenty of questions. Um, I've got to yeah. toss some of them at you. Um, Daniel was asking when, um, about uh, the Badgery Creek region. Is there still a lot of land to be developed about? around Badgery Creek and I imagine that um, yes. question speaks to the, the worry that where there's a lot of land to be developed and can suppress price, price growth. Yeah, so there is still a lot of land. Again, it hasn't all been registered or rezoned yet. So it's still in the, the process. The way the Sydney Metropolitan Plan works is that they, they look at rezoning land depending on what level of infrastructure is available. When I by infrastructure, I mean water, sewerage and power. So there's a lot of earthworks that are being done around the Badgerys Creek area, and there's a lot of suburbs. So the Oran Park area um, is pretty much price controlled. So there's one particular landowner that owns a lot of the land around there. Around Ludnam um, and Austral, there's a lot of market farmers, a lot of Italians that still own land, and they're gradually being sold to developers. Um, so yeah, there is there is a fair bit of land, but it will it won't all it won't all come on the market at once. It's got to make sense to a developer, and the rate at which they'll they'll release it will be probably slow and controlled. Um, how is the Box Hill market? Uh, Box Hill market's taken a little bit of a hit again, a bit like Riverston. It's a bit further up. Um, so places like Box Hill um, still you know still got reasonable value, but again, just got to be very careful about what you're paying. And you've got to look at recent recent land sales to uh, to compare what you're buying in that box hill market. Um, Chi Chang was uh, looking to buy a house in Maracle, but being priced out. Any other suburbs around the inner west or south where you would have potential? Uh, not sure what you think about Leichhardt as it doesn't have a train. Um, yeah, so Chi Chang, we actually have a specialist in the inner west, Nick and my team, and we love the the areas around Maracle, Dalit Hill. Um, so we think some of those areas have got a lot of potential. And Leichhardt, even though you do get the, uh, the plane noise, the A380s, well, there hasn't been many planes going overhead lately, Terry, because of the, the curfew and the, and the migration lockdown. But uh, no, we do think some, some areas around uh, Merrickville. I'd also look at St. Peter's and Sydenham. They're two other areas that I think have a lot of potential to, to go forward for, for capital growth and good, strong yield. That's where I'd, I'd be looking at. Um, question here from Zoe. Do you provide help in strategy for existing property investors to increase growth of portfolio? Uh, absolutely. Terry, you run like a mentoring program. Yeah, you can talk about that. Yeah, we do. Um, we're certainly not buyers agents. Uh, we don't do that. Um, we leave that to experts like you, Rich. But um, we mentoring is where we help people um, analyse their situation uh, 
be clear about their goals and develop strategies for achieving those goals with property investment and then start get on the path of actually looking uh, for the correct areas that fit their strategy to be looking for properties to buy. Um, I think one of the, the, the key messages that people could take away today, the importance of building your team before you build your portfolio. It's really important to have a team. Um, and I think your team should include a good buyer's agent, um, but certainly a good mortgage broker and accountant that understands real estate and many more. It's important to have all those people in place and to be talking to them before you go out there and start looking for property. Um, and I think um, some of the case studies you've just given us um, earlier, Rich, on the, the prices you got property relative to their value or potential value, the savings, um, relative to the, the fee that you might charge for that service. You know, it's a wonder, it's a, I'll put it the other way, it's an incredible form of false economy not to use a service like that because you've actually got to pay a fee for it. You're actually going to be financially much better off if you do. So build your team before you build your portfolio. Have a mentor, have a good accountant and engage a good buyer's agent, I think. Mm. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate that. That's, that's really good, good thoughts. And again, yeah, there's no one specialist that's going to give you all the answers. As Terry said, you do need a good finance broker. You do need to get good information and you do need a quality, reliable buyer's agent to work with you and a tax advisor. And again, if you need to referrals to those people, we're happy to share our, our database and, and contacts with you in that regard. Um, I might just quickly go to the Q&A. Oops, I made it too big. How do I go back to you? Um, Capil has asked any information around Parramatta area from long-term point of view. Uh, Terry, what's all? Well, I'll just give you my quick perspective on Parramatta, Terry, and then you can ch chime in. Um, the Parramatta area, particularly, I'd probably I'd be looking more to the West Mead area. Um, the Parramatta area has been rezoned for a lot more high density, so you're going to see a lot of um, higher density development coming into that Parramatta area. So I'd be very cautious about buying apartments in Parramatta. Um, I tend to be pushing out more to the medical precinct around Westmead Hospital. So Westmead Children's and, and Westmead uh, Public Hospital as an area where I'd be, I'd be looking to buy. What are your thoughts on Parramatta, Terry? Very similar to yours, Rich. I'm, I'm concerned about the level of apartment development and um, uh, you know, the vacancies have been very high there, even before the, the pandemic impact. And I think they're going to continue to be because um, they continue to build um, very large towers of apartments and that's going to tend to drag down the potential for capital growth. Um, you mentioned um, Westmead as, as a better option. Prasad's actually asking a question there in the, in the chat box about uh, the Westmead market um, mm. as a good place for a boarding house. Um, do you, um, is that something you get a requirement for from time to time? Yeah, we do. We, we work with a lot of uh, developers as well um, and we've helped developers buy boarding houses. So yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it could be a, a potential area because you do have a lot of uh, nurses and medical staff in that area that are looking for a, an affordable zone. There is quite a bit of supply though. Um, you've just got to be, be double checking what is in the pipeline, like what's been approved and there are new restrictions when it comes to building boarding houses, Terry, there's there used to be um, uh, quite lax in the regards to parking, and now the level of parking that's required for a boarding house is quite onerous. So you do need at least one, I believe it's one car space per unit, whereas you used to have, I think it was only one car space for about three or four units. So that's restricting the number of, of, of rooms per boarding house that can be built um, in an area like that. Um, question here, what's your view on the inner west housing market from Frederico? Well, inner west housing market, uh, we think it's got a lot of legs, a lot of potential. Um, we just bought a property for a client in Leichhardt and Dulwich Hill the other day, did extremely well. Um, we think it's, yeah, it's got a lot of opportunities for um, renovation potential, um, good for growth. Um, do need to be careful of buying along Parramatta Road. Um, so you wanna be further back uh, from the from the main sort of traffic drag, and again, just be, look at the areas um, that have got the right got the right infrastructure, the right sort of community feel, and the right property types. So I guess it's a pretty broad question to answer. Um, another question: I bought an investment property in Plumpton around six years ago. Will it increase in value in one to two years' time? Well, Terry, we saw from your stats there on Plumpton that it's an area that's had pretty reasonable growth. So I think the long term, if you're holding an investment property as an investor, I would say to you, don't be impatient. Um, ride out the cycles. Uh, let the property cycle do its work. Um, 
unless there's something wrong with the property, there's probably no reason to sell it. I would just hold it and let it, the thing, let it do its thing over time. Um, another question here. Uh, second season of Buying Blind. Yeah, sorry, Craig, no. <laughs> sorry to disappoint. Uh, the producers haven't contacted me to do a second series yet. Um, it did chew up a huge amount of my time, so uh, but uh, not looking to get back into the TV reality world just yet at this point. Although I'll tell you a funny story. Someone rang me from, uh, who was a big brother the other day and asked if I wanted to join. And I took about three milliseconds to say no, sorry, but I'd, I'd rather watch grass grow than go on big brother. Um, another question. No. <laughs> Hi, Rich and Terry. I'd like to buy land or house and do a duplex sell off, make 20% profit. Where do you think is the best location for this strategy right now, Richard? Um, yeah, look, doing the house and land or, or duplex strategy is challenging. Your ass so depends on your budget, Richard, too. I think the probably best thing to do is ring us and have a chat to my development team, to Daichi and Liam in my team, and, and work out what your budget is and we can advise. Um, you know, you'd need probably to be around, if you're looking at, say, the ride area, you'd probably need to be around 1.6 as an entry price. Um, in Newcastle, you can do it a lot cheaper. You can probably buy a site for about 800K. Um, I'd probably say that's a much less riskier option to do something like that because then you can, if you can't sell it um, and, and try to make you, obviously you want to make you 20%, you have to sell it to do that. But if you can't, you could can just hold it for a period of time until the market improves. So I'd say the Newcastle market would be my pick to do that kind of strategy for, um, for the duplex. Um, another question, what about, I'll just flick through a few more. What about the Hornsby, Hornsby, Heights, uh, Hornsby Heights, Mount Cola region? Um, yeah, look again, those regions a little bit further north than Hornsby. Um, if you can afford it, I would suggest buying south of Hornsby. Um, but again, if you can't afford it, then the Hornsby Heights, uh, Mount Cola, Asquith region is again, more affordable. And that's just because it's that little bit further beyond the main terminal station of, of Hornsby. Um, okay, I'm just conscious of time, Terry. Um, we might just do one more question and then wrap it up. Sorry, and we'll, I'm sorry we can't answer everything. Thoughts about some of the best suburbs in the North Shore? Um, well, Remy, that's a very broad question. There's some great suburbs on the North Shore from, you know, chats with Linfield Rose right up to Warrawee, Wurunga. Um, again, it, it, I'm not sure how to answer that question because the, it all depends on what you're looking to do if you're a home buyer or investor. Some wonderfully high, high profile, prestigious schools along the North Shore. Um, you know, it's, it's a market that has been uh, always sought after, highly resilient, and I think it will continue to be that way going forward. A lot of people are very aspirational and love to buy in suburbs like Pimble or Barumba or Warrawee on the upper North Shore. Uh, and then equally on the lower North Shore, you've got all the professionals around, um, you know, Mossman, Neutral Bay, Camaray, Cremorne. Um, so there's, there's plenty of answers to that question. And it's just a very difficult one to answer so broadly. Um, I think we're going to have to leave. Look, there's, oh, thank you so much. There's so many questions about areas. Love to answer them all, but I'm just conscious of everyone's time. We do need to wrap it up. But can I just say thank you, Terry, very much for being on the webinar with me today, sharing your incredible knowledge and insights into the market. Always value it uh, and respect your, your considered opinion. Thank you to all our viewers who've been on the, the call today. Um, appreciate you spending the time. If we can help you or answer further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch and we will be sending a recording. So I'm Rich Harvey. Thank you, Terry, for being with us. You're welcome, Rich. Always a pleasure. And look, wish you all the very best and uh, look forward to connecting with you all again very soon. Bye for now.